Awesome. Oh, so enjoy each other's company? Yes. A lot of them, a lot of each other you wouldn't have seen for a little while, huh? Yeah, some of you. Yeah. So it's lovely to catch up for some of you again and get to know everyone again. <laughs> Six months goes fast, really fast, doesn't it? You notice that? Yeah. And it's so easy to just get involved with your life again, isn't it? And, and, let, and it, let it draw you away from your desires and... You've got to be so careful about that and that's why we want to talk about addictions a fair bit. Definitely. And, and I've been standing at the back of the room uh, just trying to feel the room a little bit and I, I feel like there's a, there, initially there's like, oh, we're back. It's good. We're all back here together listening. Awesome. Fair amount of fear about the, uh, the cameras. Everyone was like, oh, for, for a while. Um, but then near the end of the session, I almost felt everyone go back into... Oh yeah, we know this. It's it's addictions, it's fear, it's grief. Yep, heard it before. We know what this is all about. Who's feeling that? Honestly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's more You're of You're tired this. of hearing about fear, addictions. Get onto another subject. <laughs> Come on, isn't there a different way to it? And I just wanted to um, maybe just relate a little bit of my experience with this. Um, and hopefully inspire you a little bit in this process because uh, I feel quite inspired in it at the moment and um, that's really an awesome place to be and it is a different way of feeling about this material that I have. It's, it's feeling about it rather than hearing about it, thinking about it and talking about it, which, um, you know, a lot of us do when we first come across it, don't we? Yeah. So, who remembers the talk I gave probably about six months ago, might be a bit longer, about addictions? Yep, with many of you there, yeah. So, back, way back then I was saying to you guys, look, I've had the realisation about addictions. There's fear, there's, there's anger rather, there's running away, there's shutting down, there's all these things that I've decided I'm not doing anymore. That's the way, that's what I usually do when my addictions get triggered. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go instead towards my fear. Who remembers me saying that? Yep. <laughs> and then I talked to you about fear and the green tree frog and how it was all like, okay, I'm going there, guys, I'm going there. And, and I have started to go there. But what else has happened in that process is I've recognised a whole other level and layer to my addictions. And how when I shake up one addiction, if I'm really not serious about this, I'm going to put in another addiction or I'm going to kid myself about something else. Now, before you all go, oh. <laughs> it's good. It's good to shake it all up and start to feel a bit off kilter and go, well, what's really going on here, you know? What, what is it? Hang on. I, I was doing that thing. I really wanted all those emotions from men. I want them to make me feel special and important and that I'm capable, worldly woman. And when they don't give me that, I get... <laughs> you did that real good. That addiction, I did that addiction real good. Yeah, both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the addiction and the impersonation of it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so I did that one really good and then I shook it up and, and realised that's really not love, that emotion I'm getting from the man. That's what I thought it was. That's what Dad taught me when he goes, oh, you're a good girl, you're, you're you know, someone to be proud of. Don't feel bad about anything at all. That's what I thought love was. And so that was, that was incredibly painful to recognise, oh, that's not love? Like, that's what I really want men to give me and it's not love. And, and so, like, that's a lot of what it has been about for me the last six months, shaking those things up and then going, oh, maybe I'll, like, do something else with men so they'll give me that emotion back or maybe I'll act in a different way. And all of it was totally av avoiding this true self place that we're talking about. Mm. The thing I wanted to say to you about it, though, is that, yes, it does hurt. <laughs> it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt breaking these addictions. Like, it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel like we're stretching in new, different ways because we've been so used to going in this same rut, this is how I feel good about myself, this is what I feel love is, and then suddenly it gets shaken up and we feel like totally like we've lost our compass, but also that little bits of us are exposed, hurdy bits. <laughs> hurty bits that we used to cover over with getting all these emotions from people and it's going to hurt 
and it, it has hurt for me quite a lot. And I've joked with AJ that I feel like um, I'm in deep. I'm, I'm like a crack addict. <laughs> Can I please just have one good emotion from somebody? Because <laughs> it really hurts when I'm not getting it anymore. No. <laughs> so. That Can you say you're on crack cocaine? Oh, no, that was the addiction. <laughs> yeah, it? that was the addiction. Yeah. I felt like I was in a, in a rehab ward. Because b- by my own admission, remember, I said, that's it. I'm cutting out these addictions. I'm going for the fears. And then, I, like, through a process, I've been I journaled so much about what were the patterns in my childhood, what were the addictions that were in place, what, what was going on in my everyday interactions. I remember one morning I was down in the eco-tent and... I, um, I had a massive realisation that AJ's already touched on. Um, and I, I marched up to the house to tell uh, Dave and Joe because I thought it was earth-shattering. Well, it, perhaps it's not. But when you get it emotionally, it really, it really got me. It was the fact that... Um, I've touched these emotions in here, hey? And a lot of you have. You've touched the causal grief and pain and the loss in your childhood, the feeling of being unloved or being rejected or being unworthy. Like, I've touched those places. I know that they're there. I know that they're there. And I know there's a hell of a lot of it in my case. Like, there's a big amount. (laughs) And so... I, had, I was sitting down there feeling about that, feeling like I know this is in me, God. I know that there's a whole area of my life that I'm avoiding and that that's the only way I'm going to connect with you if I connect to these things. And then, then it hit me that if all of that is my true self, all of that is my causal emotion, any time in my life when I'm feeling good, <laughs> I'm very likely to be in addiction. Because I just know, I know how much pain is in me. And so I went, oh man, that means like, I don't know how much of every week, or every day, every hour, every minute, I'm sitting in addiction. Or I'm sitting in a place of like numbing or trying to get an emotion from someone, trying to get an emotion from other people, trying to do something that makes me feel good to avoid what's really there. That was pretty humbling. And that's the place we all have to go to. We have to go to this place of recognising, wow, given what's already in me and how little I'm feeling that, the majority of the time, any time I feel good, it's addictive. That changed the way I looked at just about every interaction I had. (laughs) And every, every minute of my day, I went, oh, okay, what am I feeling now? Well, is that because I'm connecting to God, because I've released some causal emotion, or is it because I'm in an addiction right now? So that was very empowering. It was painful and confronting, but very empowering. And I just finished, yep. Um, And that's what I wanted to say to you about this. Most of my life, I've lived in addictions. I've been wanting to get... And I've been very successful in a lot of cases. A lot of people think I'm a very nice person. And... (laughs) Or they used to, because <laughs> I did everything to please them. They thought, gee, that Mary's a lovely girl. And all my addictions were met and I felt great, except I didn't really feel great. I actually carried massive amounts of unworthiness, feeling ugly, feeling like I didn't ever fit in anywhere, all of these things inside of me, but I just got really good at living in addiction and living in these ways to make everyone make me feel okay, and then I could avoid that for just another month or just until I got the other job or whatever it was. Mm. So that's where I've been living, and that's where I've thought I feel good, that when my addictions are met, I'm having a good life, I'm happy, and most of the time I thought I was being loved. All of my friendships with women were based on basically my feelings that I'm totally unacceptable to women and that most women hate me um, and avoiding the fear of their anger. And so I did everything to please most of my female friends. They thought I was a great friend and I could get away from that horrible causal emotion that, may, that is that I'm, most women don't like me and I'm pretty unlovable by women. So I felt like I felt good and I felt loved living in these addictions. But... All of you know, and most of the reason you're sitting in the chairs you're sitting in, is that it feels shallow after a while, doesn't it? You get to feel like, 
at the end of the day, oh, I still just really feel not very good about myself and I still feel very disconnected from God, from the people around me in an authentic way. <clears throat> so that's where I've lived, feeling good, feeling loved and really basically unhappy. And the beautiful thing about going through this process is that I have... I've started to face the pain of breaking those good love feelings, facing the addictions of it. And the beautiful thing that I keep getting to (laughs) is that what I'm finding here are two beautiful three-letter words. And that is joy and God. And that a lot of the times is very painful, feeling what I really feel about myself and what I really feel inside of me. But the the resulting sense that comes over me is not happy tap dancing, but it is a sense of, it's like, the, the closest I can describe to you is joy of feeling that I'm not running at a million miles an hour in the opposite direction of my true emotional state. And there is a beauty in that. There is a real beauty and um, almost contentment of knowing that I am with the real place. I am with really me. And the even more stunning and inspiring thing that I am finding is God. And God is helping me to um, unravel those horrible self-concepts that I've kept with me for 32 years, trying all the ways to get away from them. You know, I've carried them like my dirty little secret. And the more I'm willing to go into them, to feel them, to allow them to be, just for me to be with me and talk to God in that place, to ask God to love me in that place, which a lot of you who've read my blog know that that's been really hard for me to ask for the love in that place. But in doing that, I have found a connection to God and I'm telling you, it's so worth it. It's so worth, it's so worth this uncomfortability and this big step into, like stepping into the fear feels like you're stepping into this big dark chasm, um, as many of you know, you know, because we're not, we're not taught to have the faith, we're not born with the faith because of the error that we live in, that God is there on the other side of it. But if you can have the courage to step into those fears and to do those things, joy and God really do exist on the other side, so... That's, that's my piece of uh, inspiration before we talk about the nitty-gritty. <laughs> Can you come here and I'll just adjust your mic a little? Yeah. So what we want to do now is um, we've talked a lot about the addictions and you've talk, we've talked many other times about addictions. What we want to do is tell you or talk to you about what we do with our addictions and what the signs are that we're in addiction. Because it, many of you, even though we've talked about addictions, are still in addictions not realising what the signs are. Does that make sense? So, so what we want to do is talk a bit about what the signs are. So should we leave that beautiful diagram that Mary's just put there or do we put the extra bits around yeah. it somehow? Um, Where are you headed? Well, remember that our addictions kick off these things called expectations and demands. And, of course, they're all going out to the environment. And then when the expectations and demands are not met, what do we do? Well, there's usually those three things that we do. We try to bribe our way back into getting them. Now, do you understand what I mean by bribing your way back into them? So you go, "If, if you give me this, I'll give you that. And that's... What you could say is a bribery. So, so it's, like a, it's like entering into a bartering system about our addictions. But, but we don't do this from, from an intellectual level. We don't do it from the state where we're going, oh, I'm thinking this and I'm knowing that I'm thinking this. Rather, what happens instead is there's the emotional feeling going out of us, is I want this from you. And then there's... And, and we're like a great big radar in our soul going around. Nun, 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 nun. Oh, there's one, there's one. one will, that one will give me my addiction, right? And, and so I go up. And many of you are not realising that the reason, the whole reason why you're walking up to talk to that particular person is because that's the one that's going to meet your addictions the most in the whole room. 
That's the reason why you're talking to them many times. And so you walk up to another person and that person's going to meet the, my addictions next. And when, when they don't, you know, I hmm, don't know if I like that person very much. That person didn't give me what I wanted. So, so straight away we have a feeling even, oh, I don't know if I like them. I don't know if I get along with it. You know, we have all of these different things that come up because that emotionally at the soul level what's going on already is there's a project, projection coming from us to have an addiction met. And in the reciprocation, when the addiction isn't met, I'm going, oh, hang on a sec, I don't know if I like them because they're not doing what I want. They're not meeting my addiction. They're not meeting my demands. They're not responding to my attempts to control. Right? And so, so what we do is we first attempt the bribe. The bribe is, I'll give them a bit extra and we'll see what they do then. Does that make sense? That's the bribe. And if you think about it, most of our relationships are bribe relationships anyway, aren't they? Yeah, a I'll, lot of them. I'll do whatever you want as long as, as you long as. give me a feeling of something else. Yeah. It's always the hook back, the as long as. As long as you do this, I'll do that. Love doesn't have an as long as. Love also doesn't have... Love is a gift, remember. I keep saying this to you. Love is a gift. It doesn't have demands and expectations upon the other person. Love in itself demands things of you. It has feelings inside of you that it will demand of you. But it doesn't demand things of others. Right? It doesn't... You don't expect anything from others. You don't want to demand anything from others. And the bribe is the way to... One way to know that you're doing it. Now, the bribe is... Uh, I'm sitting down, listening to a discussion of a person that I'm a bit bored with, but I'm sitting there. How many of you have done this recently? You're sitting in a conversation and you don't really want to be in it, yeah? Okay, so a lot of you already, see there's an addiction in that. Why are you sitting in a conversation that you don't want to be in? You just say to them, I'm sorry, but I don't want to talk to you right now. What will happen if we say that? Oh, they will get all upset and offended. And, all. and so what's the addiction? We're addicted to not having the other person get upset, offended or angry with us. That's why we don't want to tell them the truth. So what, what do we do instead? We sit there going, uh, uh, I think I'll just sit here and I'll put up with this. It might stop soon. You know, like, and we're sitting there allowing it and it's the bribe in play. You're, you're actually doing that because you're preventing, you, you, you want to prevent their rage. There's the addiction. Why do we want to prevent a person's rage? We're addicted to doing that, often. You, how many times do you not tell the truth because you're afraid of the person getting angry with you? How many times has that happened? Isn't it half of our life, pretty much, isn't it? So, so there's the bribe in play. The bribe is... I'm going to put up with this situation. I'm going to not tell the truth in this situation. I'm going to just sit there and endure it for as long as it takes. And hopefully after all of that happens, then you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, they're exhausted now. They don't want to talk anymore. And that's when I'll get up and go. And, and all the way through that conversation, I've spent three hours listening to a conversation I didn't even want to be involved in. That, that's an addiction. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why it's so important to see that. The addiction is what we get out of it. The addiction is what I get back from that exchange. And many of you get many other things back from just avoiding their anger. Yeah. Many of you just want the chance for you to say your bit as well. I'll listen to them so that then... So that eventually, I can talk to them. when they exhaust themselves, <laughs> yeah. they'll listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> or I can feel like I've got the attention... Like somebody, a man is talking to me. I'm not interested in what they're saying at all, but they're giving me their full attention. That feels pretty that feels good. good. That's, that's it doesn't matter what he's saying, you, you know, he might be talking about cars, <laughs> so that's fine, I'll listen to that. <laughs> At least he's giving me the feeling, the feeling that he's interested in me. It's or... the yummy feeling I get <laughs> that makes me feel good or loved or special or nice, that's the addiction. Yeah. That's the bribe. Now, the bribe. before we ask more questions, can we go through the two other things that we do? Well, when the bribe doesn't work... See, see, sometimes the bribe doesn't work. So what we do is we, we bribe, bribe, and then by the time we start bribing too much, we think, this is costing me too much now. It's like, you know, it's a bit like if you had to bribe someone with $100, a lot of you might consider it, but if you have to bribe them with $10,000, then, you, you know, you'd have to think about that one a bit more, right? And this is what we, happens to us emotionally. Emotionally, we'll give them that bit emotionally, but if they want more than that, no, that's enough now. We, we, that's enough now. We're not, having, we're not having a part of giving them more than what we've just offered. So we go into another part, and that is the threat. 
Now, the threat is, is um, a purposeful attempt to get the person into their fear, and because of their addiction to avoiding that fear, they then act in harmony with what you threaten. That's, that's what a threat... It's the purpose of the threat. So many times you see this happen if, say, AJ and myself are in an addictive relationship, bribing, 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 getting lovely feelings back and forth, and one person in the relationship says, I don't want to be a part of this bribery anymore, I'm going to change. If the other person still wants those addictions met, they'll be very tempted to act upon my fear. And to, threaten. Uh, threaten me. To get well, if you're going to do that, I'm leaving. Or if you're going to do that, you know, you're going to have to leave. Or if you're going to do that, I'm going to, we're going to sell up, you'll have nothing. Or if you, you know, there's all these different things and are oftentimes motivated by spirits as well, talking through the person, where their identification of the fear, and often with, with a couple, you understand each other's fears pretty well generally, particularly if you've been with each other for a few years, right? You do understand them. So, so what you finish up doing is you, you know the fears and bribe works, bribe works, bribe works, bribe works. All of a sudden bribe doesn't work and now we're ready to threaten. Now, that's not love, but we're ready to do it. We're ready to go ahead into the threat. And, and to be frank, many of us do that quite readily. And you think how many of you have experienced that from your own families in the last 6 to 12 months? The threat. You know, if you do that, if you keep going along and listening to this AJ character, that's it, not having anything to do with you anymore. Or you, you'll just see what happens. You know, there's all these threats about what AJ's character might be. They don't even know who I am threatening you about my character. Like... And so, so a lot of times there's threats about, you know, what you're doing, where you're going. You know, in a relationship, you see this happening quite frequently with regard to a person who gets controlling in the relationship, wanting to know every single moment of the day where their partner is. We were just talking at the break with the guys about you can now get the iPad linked up with the iPhone and know exactly where your partner is at any moment of the day. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Pretty controlling too. Isn't it? Now the threat, the threat doesn't necessarily ever get carried out. That's the purpose of the threat. The threat is just there to scare the person enough to move them back into the bribe, to move them back into the addictive, uh, into the addictive interplay. Does that make sense? Now the threat often works because it triggers the fear the person doesn't want to feel. And then they want to feel good, so instead they go back into their own addiction and give you something so that they're no longer threatened. That's how the threat works. The threat is a great way of making a person go and do anything without you having to do anything except say something. You don't have to act upon it. You're not, it's not like you're going to walk out the door tomorrow. Like, I'm going to walk out the door tomorrow. Yeah, sure. You know, like most of the time you're not, right? But, but you say it because there's the threat, the threat of it gives the scare, right? And you'll see this happening in all sorts of relationships. I, ha I have an example if you want to. Fire away. Yeah. So um, I, think a I think a lot of you who met me a few years ago uh, when I first met AJ, remember that I was so in love in my previous relationship before I met AJ. I, I mentioned it in one of the talks. That, that, you know, this was the big love that I'd been in before I met AJ. Well, c certainly over the course of, probably over the last year, I've really been deconstructing that relationship. It's a really good way of look, looking at what a lot of my addictions were and the lack of love that was actually there. So in this relationship, um, some of my true self, some of my causal emotion is the fact that I've always felt very awkward and um, unattractive um, and shy around men. Most, all of my adolescence, or most of my uh, 20s, felt very, like, unworthy around men. B very unattractive. Um, I only had two boyfriends uh, and they, they, yeah, it wasn't a big connection there at all. Um, <clears throat> my, this relationship with this man was with a man who a lot of women wanted. A lot of, he was quite arrogant and a lot of women thought he was, like, a bit of all right. He'd been a big player and he chose me. Wow. So that, in my addictiveness, made me feel like I was really special. I was a special, attractive girl because someone who was a big player chose me. 
It's very addictive and yucky and I'm still a bit ashamed about it. So I, w I went merrily into addiction within that relationship. I thought it was love. Wow, because I felt so good. There was so many of my addictions being met. I, I just thought it was, it was love. He, uh, on the other hand, probably didn't think it was love. But anyway, uh, in the course of the relationship, it turned out that I was the worker. I did all of the work. We lived in another country and I paid all of the bills. And he eventually got a job and said, oh, look, I'll start paying for some things and I want to get a mobile phone and I'll pay for the mobile phone. After six months, that just wasn't happening. I was just paying for everything all of the time. As well as the mobile phone. Now. As well as the mobile phone. <laughs> yeah, additional expense. Uh, and one evening I just brought up, look, are you going to pay for the mobile phone from your work? You know, that was it. Immediately he was very upset and he gave me a long uh, lecture about how if, it was, if we were really together and if it was really our money, I would never raise an issue like that. And he really thought maybe we should consider whether we should still be in a relationship or not. Threat. <laughs> Threat to my true self emotions, which are, I feel horribly unattractive and that all men are going to reject me. I didn't want to feel that at all, so I went straight back to addiction, back into the bride and went, look, don't worry, you're right, I'm wrong. It's really, you know, it is about us in it together and it's about money. That, like, I'm, I've, I'm messed up about money. Blame myself, allow the bribery to continue. So it's very, like, that's a pretty striking example, <laughs> but it's one that I skipped over. I didn't see that till much after the relationship had ended. And most of our relationships are littered with this kind of um, bribery. Sometimes it's a little less subtle, a little more subtle than that. That was mm. fairly extreme. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Is there any questions about threat? We'll talk more in, we'll, we'll allow you to ask more questions when we present the third one as well. The third one is the next extreme from the threat. You see, the threat only works if you're prepared to act upon your threat. You see? And so what happens is we, we often make the threat, but then because nothing's happening, nothing's changing, we then have to revert to actually acting upon the threat. And that's where the blackmail begins, and that's uh, pretty extreme now. In, we're now. We're now totally prepared to put this threat into action and actually we're now blackmailing the person through the action of the threat, we're now blackmailing the person into conforming to what we want them to do. Totally. In other words, we have no respect for their free will, we have no respect for love in that place and now what we're doing is we're just basically pushing them around. And we're only doing it because we want to avoid some of our own emotions. That's the only reason why we're doing it. And in particular, we want to avoid being loving because the loving thing to do would be to do none of those things, actually. Not bribe them, not threaten them and not blackmail them, but rather just let them make their own choices and decisions. Does that make sense? That's the loving thing to do. You're also allowed to make your own choices and decisions, but your choices and decisions are completely independent to anybody else's choices and decisions. So you can choose to leave if that's what you wish to do, but don't make it dependent upon something they do. Because that is not, you know, that's now a blackmail situation. Does that make sense? I wouldn't leave Mary unless I decided I wanted to leave Mary. <laughs> not because of anything Mary's doing. Does that make sense? It'll be because of my decision of what I feel is good for me. All right. Now that we've presented the three, Graham. is there any questions about them? Graham has one. Graham? And the other mic's still sitting on the desk there. There it is there. So you just need to turn it on. Um, could any of these things look like bribery, look like a threat, or look like blackmail, but you're really just behaving um, in your own self love? Um, but the other person, through their errors, sees it as bribery, or as a threat, or as blackmail? Certainly, Graham. That is very true. You, you, can, uh, you see, a person who is fully connected to themselves will do exactly what they desire to do every single point in time. 
Now, now, once we get closer and closer to God, that will be more and more harmonious with love every time. So once you become at one with God, you will do exactly what you desire to do in harmony with love at every moment. Now, the people, that means that you no longer respond to the bribes, threats or blackmails from others. Now, people are so used to doing those things that they actually believe you should do whatever their bribe or threat or demand, uh, their demands and expectations demand. And so... Often they then interpret what you're doing as being threatening or blackmailing, but, but you feel calm and you're just making a decision and choice for your own life. And uh, yes, a lot of times you are accused of it. And none of us want to be accused of this, you see. And that's one of our addictions. We don't want to acu be accused of bribing or threatening or blackmail or unloving. Woe betide us if we're accused of unloving behaviour. Right? So what we try to do is if somebody just accuses you of unloving behaviour, that in fact could be their blackmail on you. Oh, you're being unloving now. Like, hang on a sec, all I did was I just wanted to make a choice and decision based upon my own desires. They're all harmonious with God's love. How can I be unloving? I want to do this. I'm allowed to do that. Like, um, I've had that happen a lot in the last few months with setting up this God's Way of Love organisation where people are accusing me of all sorts of things about my motives and my desires and everything, about I want to control people and all these other things. No, I just want to set up this. I just want to do that because that's my passion. That's the only thing that I'm doing it for. And all of these other accusations are just their own opinions and their own reading into the lines of it all. And it can, in fact, be their attempts at blackmail, can't it? Yeah, their attempts of blackmailing others. So uh, is often the, the, the attempt. You know, they don't agree with it, so they then go down the track of saying, oh, there's ulterior motives or whatever. A lot of times, you know, you think about your own motives in life. You're not conscious necessarily of ulterior motives most of your life, are you? Most of your life you're attempting to do things to a loving degree to a, to a certain extent. It's not like you're sitting there planning, how can I destroy such and such life? How can I make, you know, there's very few of us on earth actually doing that. I suppose in terms of sometimes there is, like governments can contemplating going to war with another country is definitely a contemplation of the destruction of their life. But... But in our day-to-day -day life, we're not usually in the place where we're contemplating the destruction of other people's lives. We're often just wanting to go ahead with what we desire to do. And, uh, and sometimes other people accuse us of all sorts of things that we don't have any feeling for or feelings inside of us about. So just because somebody call, says you're bribing me, it doesn't mean you are. And just because somebody says, oh, you're threatening me now, it doesn't mean you are. But... What I'm talking about is my own emotions here. Remember, this is about your personal relationship with God. And every time you point the finger at saying, oh, but they're accusing me of bribing them, then I'm not. Every time you point the finger away from yourself, you're also not dealing with something inside of yourself. The question that I would be asking myself is, okay, I'm getting accused of, being, of, bri you know, of, of threatening people. All right, a am I really threatening people? What's my law of attraction here? What, you know, what is happening inside of me? Do I feel bad about telling people the truth? Or what is it? There's, there's some kind of law of attraction involved with the accusation. So feel that. You see, it's not... I, I can't control Mary's desire to connect to God. I can't control Mary's desire even to connect to me, let alone connect to God. I can't even control Mary's desire to connect to herself so that she can be connected to God or myself. I can't control any of those things. The only thing I can do is deal with my own emotions that prevent me from connecting to God, deal with my own emotions that prevent me from connecting with myself and my own emotions that prevent me from connecting to Mary. I can't do anything about Mary's at all. All I need to do is my own. And every time we take the focus away from ourselves in terms of, all right, what's my issue here, and we put the focus back on the other person in any relationship, what's their issue here, we're taking away our power to change our life every time we do that. So we need to give that up. Like, give up analysing what their motives are. A lot of times people have all sorts of motives towards myself. I've given up trying to analyse what their motives are. I just feel my feelings about what they've done. That's all. 
If you analyse their motives, if you analyse their feelings, you take away your power to change what's going on. Because the only thing you can change is your own soul. You can't change them. You try changing them. You try it for a week or a month. See how long the relationship lasts when you try to change somebody. It doesn't last very long generally unless they have an addiction to that. <laughs> yeah. So that... Yes, so the answer is yes, Graham. Yes, people can accuse you of those things. It doesn't mean you're doing them, but you need to look at yourself still because there will be other things in play. Thank you. Yep. If we go to Lorleen over there. Um, this is about um, expectation and demands. Um, um, when society puts on um, expectations and mannerisms, protocols and, you know, ethical ways of doing things, um, they're controlling us as a cultural thing. Definitely. But who is controlling who? Are we controlling each other? Is that what we're doing? Well, well most societal demands are about group control, are they not? Like a group of people want us to control the individual. And, you know, a lot of things that happen in companies are the same. A group of people control an individual and so forth. And, why, you know, we've got to make the choice. Do we want to be involved in that? And now, now my feelings are, well, if it's unloving, then I don't probably want to be involved in it. But if, it, if I feel it's loving, then I'll be involved if I want to be. So there's no, you don't have to worry so much about, you know, what do I do in this circumstance or what do I do in that circumstance? Because when you feel love inside of yourself, you automatically know what the loving thing to do is in the, in the circumstance that's there. You don't have to think about it. It's just an automatic reaction. If it's not an automatic reaction, then it means there is fear involved, there is some emotions involved and possibly some addictions involved. Love should be, and the way God created you, is that love is an automatic response as long as you have released your grief and your fear and your addictions. So... You, you, can, you have all the prospect of getting into a state of one with God where you no longer have any addictions driving anything you do at all. No addictions. And you will know automatically when somebody is attempting to control you emotionally. You just know it automatically. You can feel it coming from them as a, as a feeling. So they can be going nice, smooth words. Oh, you're such a lovely person. I love talking to you. And the, at exactly the same time coming out of their soul is, I'm really needing you to give me approval right now. So in other words, they're saying the words of love but not feeling the feelings of it. And you'll get to a point in your own development where you can feel that going on, where you can feel, ah, you're saying all these words but I'm not feeling anything. Huh? Give me the feelings. <laughs> The feelings are the real thing. I feel like the thing that stops us sensing that the most is our own addictions. Yeah. yeah. When we're in addictions, we cannot feel... To be frank, we're feeling ourselves mostly and mostly we're feeling our avoidances. We're, we're, we're attempting to deny our own fears when we're in our addictions. And in that place... It's very, very hard for you to feel any single person around you and what their motivation is, what drives them, what kind of emotions they have towards you. When you release those addictions and those fears, you will find it's like a barrage of information coming into you constantly. This constant barrage of information of what is that person feeling? What is this person? Every time you come up to talk with me after the group or whatever, I can feel the underlying emotional reason why you're present there. Now, it's not because I'm special, it's because I've let go of a lot of my addictions, not them all, because I've still got some, because if I didn't have, I'd be at one with God now. Does that make sense? So, but I've let go of so much of my addictions now where I can feel what's coming from you. And you can do exactly the same thing. You will feel what's coming from others. Not through your addictions, because it's impossible to do so, not through your fears, but you'll feel their real emotion. And you'll be able to love them in that process. So you feel a demand coming from them and you will still be able to love them even though the demand is unloving coming to you and you'll still be able to love them. It doesn't mean you'll do what they want. You'll just love them still. You, st you won't feel angry and upset and vicious or resentful of, of them. Does that make sense? Ivana, would you like to... Just leave your hand up. No, she's got it. Uh, she's got it, Mike. Um... 
So, um, talking about bribery, threats and blackmail, um, I feel that's been going on between Justin and I, the yep. emotional bribery. Um, and I've, like, I've been out of the house now for, like, two weeks or something, and I have threatened to leave. Um, but now that I have left, like, I feel... Um, like, I've done all that stuff that you've written on the board, but it still feels crap. Yep. Like, um, I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but... Can I, can I help you with why it feels crap? Because, because we're often in this place where we're between the addictions and the fears, but we're not yet allowing ourselves to actually go to the causal emotion. And while you're in that state where you're still trying to, like, cycling between the fears and the addictions, and yet not feeling the grief of why this is happening or what's really going on, what, how, in, in your case, it's related to how your father has treated you in your childhood, and not feeling that emotion. In Justin's case, it's related to how both of his parents have treated him in his childhood and not feeling that emotion. And while you're feeling, not feeling that, and in this fear-based place, it's a terrible place. It's where you have all this inner turmoil, you have all this, like, you feel uncertain about your life, you don't want to act, you feel like there's this terrible feelings constantly going on, turmoil inside of you, you feel afraid, in between afraid and then wanting to get the addiction met and trying to numb it out, and you go through this cycle, until you allow yourself to just feel the grief. And oftentimes the grief can happen within a day or two days and bang, it's gone. And we don't let ourselves go there and so what we feel is the pain of staying here because we're now conscious we've now had an awakening that that's where we are but but we are unwilling yet to go to the actual grief based emotion that's so so the key is to pray about getting and and dealing with the fears that prevent you from dealing with the grief based emotion <coughs> when you deal with the grief based emotion the entire thing can disappear within days hours Sometimes. The entire, what you think is this terrible big thing that's guided your entire life with God, with God's love entering you in this place. Because remember, when you prepare to feel this, God's love enters you in this place. And so quite often, sometimes the things you're terrified of, that you've spent years and years of your life denying and trying to run away from and getting your addictions met about, within moments sometimes, like when I say moments, like within half an hour, an hour, two hours of crying, the whole thing can be gone because as, as you're doing that, God's love is entering you and helping erase the causal error. But God's love can't do its work while we are not connected with our true self. I guess just one of my blocks is that I feel like it's so huge and like I don't even want to go there anyway. Yep. And the belief that it's so huge is in a way it's almost a lack of faith in God. It's, we're saying, what we're saying to God is, look, my problems are so big that no matter how much power you have, you can't solve my problem. That's really what we're saying to God. We're telling God that he does not have the power to actually help us get through this emotion. And if you can see that, that's a major causal emotion in itself, isn't it? Like, we're actually, we've got this belief going on in our mind and also probably in our feelings that God can't help us deal with things and yet God created our very being. How can it be that God can't help us? And so what we finish up doing is we finish up going into this place where we're so fearful of this place and yet that is the place, once we get there with God, it can go so quickly that, that two weeks later we think, why was that such a bad problem? You know, like. And so, like, um, with the belief that um, God can't help me, um, like I view God as male at yep. this present moment, does that mean that it's related to my stuff with Dad too? Like yeah, so things? you could say the blockage towards God is Dad is God. Many of us have some pretty basic things going on at our soul level. What happens when we're very, very young? We grow up starting to think that mum and dad are the gods of our universe. They are the ones that I've got to do everything for. They are the ones with the rules. If I break those rules, I get punished. And so they are the ones that we see as God. So what we do is we project 
the stuff that we feel with dad towards God. Now, God is not your dad. God is much better than your dad is ever capable of becoming, even. Because God has this infinite amount of love prepared for you to receive. And your dad is going to be dependent on that love just as you are. So God has this huge ability to love, infinite ability to love. Your dad will never have that. So he can never be God and he will never be as good as God. And yet one of our false beliefs is that God is like our parents are. God is like our religion has told us God is. God is like, you know, the punishing, demanding, unjust God that we believe God to be. And God's none of those things. And that's where a lot of our unwillingness to get to our emotion begins. Because we don't feel God cares enough to even help us with our emotion. Yeah, that's what I feel. And like, God's not really there because I felt like my dad wasn't really there. Exactly. Yeah. So let go. What we need to do, and this is something that everyone needs to learn to do eventually, is separate what your mother did and what your father did from what God does. We constantly project what God does, and we constantly project what happens in our family towards God as if God is that person doing those things. God's nothing like your mother, nothing like your father. At Thank all. you. Yeah. Thanks. And we need to let go of that belief. And can I relate that to, Ivana, what you're feeling? You know, that's what I was trying to say when it hurts. It hurts because we're, we're trying to break free of these addictions and we're stepping into the fears and we're not quite there yet. When we get there, ironically, the pain doesn't feel as torturous. It feels relieving. It's just, so stay the course, you know, and, and remind yourselves of truths that... Just remind yourself why you're here. Why you're here, the reason why you're here is because you believe things about here that are untrue. Once you believe the truth about these things, it'll all flow from you quite easily. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest issues that most people I feel face, is they have this belief that their own emotions are so big that even God is not going to be able to help them through them. So we... In the end, we have very little faith in God, eh? Yeah, that's why I was talked about faith the side of a mustard seed could move a mountain. If we had that kind of faith, then we can move mountains. That's how much faith most of us have. I, I don't see many of us moving mountains yet. So that how, that's how much faith we yet have in God. And yet we need to develop that faith in God. God is far greater and better than anything you can imagine at the moment. And even once you become at one with God and once you continue to progress and become at one with your soulmate, God is still going to be greater than anything you can imagine. Yep. Um, it's, it's on. Yep. I've got a lot of dad issues mm -hmm. and you're saying we have to separate God from dad yeah i truly believe in my heart and i feel that that i have separated i do separate god from my dad mm -hmm. but is it possible to to be, get there without doing major processing or no it isn't possible yeah you need to do some major processing because it, the tr the truth is that the emotion about the masculine about masculinity remains in you until you release and forgive your dad until there's full forgiveness of your of your dad your earthly dad the emotions about men are going to remain present within you and the masculine side of God that is going to receive those projections from you. It's the same if you have a whole group of emotions about women from your mum or from the relationships that you've happened during your life. Those emotions about women will be projected upon the feminine side of God, if you like. And so it's impossible to actually have a complete relationship with God until those emotions are dealt with. However, we can at least hear, understand that God is not my dad. God is not my mum. We can at least have some trust that God is far better than anything we've ever experienced. We can at least trust that. So you can be projecting dad stuff onto God without even realising it, thinking that... You are projecting dad stuff on God until all of your male stuff is released. Even without realising. Without 
realising it, yes. Well, you're projecting your dad's stuff onto every male and part of God is masculine. So until we heal, this is why we stress the importance of the emotional work with your, you know, in your childhood so much because until we clear those really basic core injuries with masculinity and femininity, that is imposed on every man and woman and the masculine and feminine elements of God automatically. And of course, God doesn't hurt about them <laughs> because... She, he, is actually clear of any, like, doesn't have any emotional injuries like people, other people on earth do. So, so God is infinitely loving. And so God just says, oh, yeah, there she goes again, projecting her beliefs of, uh, from her dad on me. Uh, you know, what can I do to help her through that process? And it doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with God while you have injuries, but you just, it will never be complete while, you know, while they're still in you. So those feelings of immense love and gratitude that I feel toward God, that is authentic? That, yeah, that can still course. be very real even though there's this projection that I'm unaware of? Your true well, self has authentic feelings of love and things towards God. But your true self also still has some fears about God and mm. still has some addictions with God. It was pointed out to me by a friend recently that I, I know I have blocks with, with processing things and I get really frustrated with those blocks but it was pointed out perhaps I'm angry with God and that was such a foreign, oh, even to have that concept that I could be, I'm thinking, no, I don't have any feelings of anger toward God. But then we did dissect it and discuss it as far as the dad thing and the male and I see God as male. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, I don't even know how to be angry with God, how... I don't feel worthy to be angry with God. How yeah, well, can the, I... probably the first question is, uh, is to ask is why you're so afraid of being angry with God. Because uh, in the end, um, oftentimes we have all these religious beliefs associated with, you know, if I get angry with God, then God's going to somehow, you know, I'll have a bad day tomorrow, you know. Yeah. No, <laughs> that, I, that's I'm not aware of, of feeling that. You, you're not aware of feeling it, but that doesn't mean the feelings yeah. aren't present within yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, you'll discover them if you go through the process. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Can Thank you, you. See as well that when we resist God's process, there is an anger. There can be, there is often an anger in that mm. in that state. Maybe yeah. I just believe I'm not allowed to get angry. Yeah, and I'll that get, is I'll get into trouble by dad. By dad. Yeah. Mm. Well, what What did most ha for most of you? If you ever got angry with your dad, what did you get? That sort of doesn't help you to be angry again with a man, does it? So what do you use instead? A bit of cajoling here, a bit of bribery there. A bit of, bit of threat. You know, <laughs> to avoid the, the rageful response. Thank you. Mm. Um, if we... Up the back there. Hi, AJ. Hey, Hi, Mary. Hi. Nice to see you guys. Um, I, this may have been covered earlier, um, but I just wondered... Um, I see a lot of people with really beautiful functioning friendships in their life where they don't tend to rely on bribery and threat and blackmail and there's a lot of openness and authenticity and calling each other on emotions and things coming from a really good space and I just wondered if you could maybe share a bit about why is it so, why do people find it so much harder in romantic or family relationships to, to have the same equanimity? You know? If you think about it, you'll see the answer is really like as plain as the nose <laughs> on your face as the saying goes. Once we enter relationships that are due to love relationships with a partner, immediately the mother and father injuries kick into play. And that's why most people have difficulty in their relationships. Because that's where most of the addictions come from, and the mother and father based injuries. And the biggest fears of feeling our true self. Yep. Of feeling the deep, of the pain in our childhood, that's that's where our damaged self concept came from, yep. is our childhood. And so, when we enter a relationship that it means a lot to us, and we desperately often we have a lot of addiction, but our fear is heightened of feeling these things. Yeah. So for that reason, it's automatic almost as soon as we enter a relationship that the relationship will begin triggering our emotional addictions. And, and if the addictions don't get met, 
then our fears start getting exposed. Most of us are very anti our fears being exposed and so we get into anger instead and before you know it, the relationship's having problems. So, so can I, sorry, can I ask another? So is it kind of a bit of a dynamic between because there's more to be gained, there's therefore more to be feared to be lost? Is it kind of... Yes, it's not only that, but there's also the fact that uh, when we're with our friendships, our addictions are often automatically in play. That's why we feel so good about them. So, for example, um, we usually attract friends who don't... Like, you'll, if you've been treated badly by your father, for example, you'll do one of two things. You'll either attract men into your life who are not like your father, totally the opposite to your father, or you'll attract men into your life who are the same as your father. Now, it's more highly likely to attract men into your life that are opposite your father. The reason why is because you take one look at the man who's like your father, and if you didn't like your father, you go, I don't like him, right? And so you don't spend time with him. Whereas if there's another man who's totally the opposite of your father, right, you've still got the unhealed emotion within yourself, but there's a man there, he's, he's totally opposite. He, he's really gentle and kind with women. He does whatever women want. That's totally opposite of what my father was. I like him. He's so nice. Not realising that my addiction is still in play because I've yet to deal with the emotion with my father. And that's what I'm staying away from by actually entering this addictive relationship with that man. He's, he's the opposite to my dad, so he's going to give me the things dad, daddy never gave me. Does that make sense? So a lot of the so-called friendships even are also about the addictions getting met. But they're not as much in play as you say because usually with the relationship we have a lot more at stake. We want a long-term, generally, close relationship. Where it comes from is that every single one of us inside of our soul has a soulmate desire somewhere. And that's a desire to connect to one other person in this universe, which is the other half of themselves. Every single person has that underlying desire within them. And because of that, as soon as a partnership begins, any emotional damage or injury blocking that relationship begins to be triggered. And most people can't bear the results of it because it, it, it sends them into grief. And instead of feeling their grief and their fear, they want the addiction met. And as soon as that happens, then you get anger, fighting, you know, resentment and bickering, and eventually it gets so bad that you, there's no attraction left. So they leave. So the average cycle on the planet with a relationship is initial intense attraction. A period of time where the intense attraction might remain. Then the addictions start coming into play. The fears start getting triggered and so forth. And then the attraction starts waning, and it gets to a point where they're arguing, fighting, just want to leave each other, so they leave. Now, that relationship cycle, which happens to many people in their life, if you look past your own life, for many of you, you've had that relationship cycle happen. Even if you've been married for 50 years, you might be in the last phase of that cycle. So, where there's no passion left, there's no desire left, there's just, you know, you're getting along but not really, and there's no passionate sexual desire for each other. And all of that happens because the addictions are now almost fully in play and we're just unwilling to address them. We're unwilling to go to their real emotional cause. Yeah. Thank you. The, the basis of most intense attraction, would you not say, is in my life has been addiction. Yeah. 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 So no, nowhere in that whole natural, if you like, common relationship cycle does pure love ever... For a lot of people, they just say, oh, I just saw them across the room and that's the person, that, you know, like that's the description. And this is the romanticised view, view we have of soulmates. We have this romanticised view that somehow you automatically knew them. Well, that, to a degree that might be true, but let's face it, most of us have got fears and addictions around the true self. How do we even recognise them while they're all in, pre in play? We can't. So, so, so when we have that initial attraction, instant attraction going on with a person, we've got to be very careful because in that particular place, there's probably highly likely that that person is like tailor-made to fit every one of my addictions. And, and go ahead if you want with the relationship, but be aware that actually this is going to be a relationship that's going to help me trigger and work my way through a lot of those addictions. The truth is when we're both our true selves, 
without the fears and addictions, we will recognise our soulmate immediately. Because yep. obviously, we're going to be so much like each other, have so much of the same passions, we're just going to naturally gravitate towards each other. But well, that's only after only the addictions when. and fears are... Yep. Like, if you, if you asked Mary three years ago whether she was attracted to me, what was the answer then? Maybe. <laughs> What, who were we talking to in the break, Liam? And he was at the first meeting where we met. He was like, mm, ended pretty badly, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, it was just like, because it triggers, it triggers so many different things. And a lot of you give me a hard time, hey? You're like, oh, you're with this amazing guy and you kept rejecting him and you were angry and whatever. None of my addictions were being met. Nothing. No, no addiction. No addiction. No make me feel good. No make, help me avoid the causal self. That's why it was so rocky. And you wait until you have someone where nobody meets your addiction and see how you feel. <laughs> Doesn't it feel good. It didn't matter that I was being loved because I didn't rec This is the point about addictions. I didn't recognise love. I had no... I, now I'm so humbled by the fact that I'm starting to and to receive such a gift. But in the beginning, <coughs> addictions were what I knew was love and he wasn't giving me any of them. And I, I really felt very afraid and because I didn't want to feel it, I got angry. Yeah. And so a lot of times we come into the relationship saying, love is the guy or girl who's going to meet my addictions. That's love. That's what we believe love to be. And when they don't, we go, well, they don't love me very much. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the, or, and they might be loving you by telling you the truth about yourself. And yet you're rejecting that. Linda. Hey, guys. Um, I have a bit of confusion about the, what you were talking about earlier, about, um, you know, if your dad's a certain way, you're either going to end up with someone who's like your dad or the opposite. Um, I found that my mum ended up with the opposite of her dad. And when I get triggered by men, it, often I think of my grandfather and... You know, because my dad seems to be quite introvert, introverted um, in certain ways, um, eh, which doesn't really make sense anyway. Um, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I... What's the question? Linda? Yeah, what's the question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got some fear. Um, okay, the question is, is it possible that you know, some of the injuries in me about men is um, about my grandfather, like as a separate? Highly, highly possible because you, you, receive, yes. you receive injuries from both parents. I so saw your, him often your as well. your mother's beliefs about men, where did they come from? Yeah, from they her dad. They come from her interaction with her father. Yeah. And so therefore... Yeah, because I've been trying to relate everything back to my dad, but some things like I just think of my grandfather like often yeah. like just you know like that anger that you know I've got towards men it, yeah. I just think of him and yeah. how mum feels and that's you know, how the same your mum feels about men so it's not mom. necessarily about my dad I mean there's certain things that I think of my dad but remember it's your whole environment that affects your your injuries, your self-concept as you're growing up yeah and for each of us like the majority of my injuries with men are going to be from my dad and from how my mum feels about men. Mm. The majority of my injuries with women or with myself are going to be from how my dad feels about women or how my mum feels about herself. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right up the back there. Hi. Um, I've just recently realised that um, one of the emotions to, um, about anger towards men um, is coming from not so much my childhood, um, but my teenagehood, um, having a stepfather and having a father figure for the first time in my life, um, or second time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether um, that's causal stuff, you know, because if it is, then I've got a whole issue to deal with that I... I'm just avoiding why, at the moment. Why do we keep asking the question, is this causal? Because I've got this impression that it's all got to be about the childhood, not when you actually have your free will. No, it's all about the unloving emotions. Okay. Whenever there's an unloving emotion within yourself, there's a causal emotion to deal with. Quite, it's quite that simple. Some of your unloving emotions are going to come from your, your childhood, a lot of them, most of them. Some will come from your teenage life, some will come through your relationships, some will come from old age. 
and all your resentment about that. There, there's all sorts of different okay. emotions that are based around unloving principles. We need to focus on the unloving thing first. So if we feel a feeling that we know is unloving, there's definitely some emotions to deal with in there. And it doesn't matter, as long as you're feeling that there's a shift emotionally within you when you're actually processing that emotion, it doesn't matter what memories it triggers, because to me it's very much, yeah. it always comes back to a memory, you know, and, yep. and then I feel like, well, this can't be it because this happened recently, so how can that be a causal well, emotion? Well, there will always be a relationship between what you're releasing and all the different events in your life. Sometimes there'll be 50 different events all related to the one same emotional injury. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? And that feels a lot like yeah. that too. And yeah. Go on. A lot a lot of I feel like a lot of people's questioning about is it causal am I, you mm -hmm. know a lot of it is based around our fear and dread of emotions. Themselves. Yeah, most yeah. of it is addiction actually. Have to feel all of that, you know, and, we're, and we want reassurance that we're not going to have to feel that or we're doing it right or whatever. And, my and that's an addiction. Is, like mm -hmm. my wanting reassurance is, is an addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So if I went, Mary, tell me, tell me, it's okay, tell me, it's okay, tell me. Um, what, what does that feel like to you? Does that feel needy? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an addiction? Tell me I'm okay, tell me I'm okay. Like, if I don't already know I'm okay, then I obviously don't feel I'm okay, so I need to just feel I'm not okay. Does that make sense? It's, it's actually a lot simpler than many of you are making it. And, and what I remember is that um, God designed this process and designed me. So I, I'm going to be okay as long as I trust it and step into it, as long as I stay out of addiction and am humble about my fears and my causal emotions. When we're not afraid of our emotion, we won't go, oh, should I feel this one or is this like an effect or is this a... We'll just feel. We'll just feel because we know it's a beautiful quality of our soul to feel and we will trust that our feelings will lead us to a causal place. The reason so many of us get stuck in our effect emotions is because we live in addiction. We don't want to face the fear and we don't want to go to our true self. If we can work on those fears, then the minute we start feeling, even if it's an effect, we will be guided beautifully by our soul through our longing to God to take us to our deepest place and it'll be gone from us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. What we'd like to do now, though, is shift into this zone of what, how, how the spirits interact with these, with these addictions, if you like. So you imagine you're, you're sitting there and you've got all of these addictions in play. They're all emotions that you're trying to avoid, fears you're trying to avoid, which you've now turned into things that you want from other people, expectations. Remember, what we expect from others and what we demand from others is now being projected out of ourselves emotionally. It's coming out of our soul whether we like to believe it is or not. They're just all these demands, all these expectations coming out of our soul. It's like an antenna radiating out all of its stuff. So an antenna... At the moment, we can pick up a signal here from Brisbane, a television station, right? That's because of the radiation that we receive. We're receiving a radiated signal and I'm feeling it. I, I can actually feel it. Your body can feel it, but, but we need sensitive apparatus, electronic equipment that tunes into it. It oscillates and tunes into it and then we get the frequency of that particular oscillation and we start receiving all of that information. Well, that is exactly the same as what happens to our soul. It's exactly the same process. We have radiating it out of our soul like a transmitter. All of our addictions, all of our expectations, all of our demands coming out of us. And so does our neighbour, our next door neighbour or our, or our friendly... Sister-in-law. And so does our partner. Right? They've all got the same thing radiating out of them, same kind of thing. All of their additions and expectations radiate automatically. And then we have a heap of spirits in the spirit world who many times don't want to be there because where they are is in quite a dark place. And they also can feel this radiated signal coming out of us, coming out of us, all of these addictions which are very jagged in their formation coming out of us to the universe, in fact, everywhere. The blue one, they're the spirits. They're the spirits, yeah, okay. the blue ones over there. Right? <laughs> um, My stick figures aren't as good as his. Yeah. All right, so we've, 
Now, what are the spirits going to do? It's pretty logical, isn't it? You're going to feel which demand you'd like to, to pander to just so long as one of my demands gets met. So if I'm a spirit and I go around and I'm zoning around, I can feel them. Oh, Raj, he wants to, be, he wants to feel good from women. And, I, and if I'm a woman, I zone into Raj and go, I'll, get, I'll make him feel good. I'll give him a few nice feelings from the spirit world for Raj. But I want to feel good as a woman from Raj. Right? So as long as Raj is willing to give me that emotion and enter into that addiction, I'm happy to enter this relationship. And I might, because we might become so bound together that I follow Raj around for the rest of his life. Giving him those emotions and he gives me those emotions. He's never able to fully enter into a relationship with his soulmate because he's already sharing some of his emotions with other women around the place and particularly with me in the spirit world, assuming that I'm a woman in this example. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so he, he's automatically in this addictive relationship with me and I'm in this addiction with him. How many of you have uncovered this kind of uh, interaction in your process or in your process? How many of you have so noticed much? that you're heavily in addiction with spirits at different times? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's a major problem, isn't it, on the earth, really? Yeah. Yeah, and this was something that I was very humbling for me to go through because, you know, I had my big declaration, that's it for me in addictions, I'm really stepping into this. And I cut out a lot of my addictions here in the physical, in relationships. And I had to come to realise that because I didn't really want it yet, I attracted a whole group of spirits that started to give me those feelings, that started to make me feel like, no, you're, you're, a, good, you're a good girl to be proud of, you're, you're all right. And, and it was very subtle and it took me, you know, a process of praying and feeling about it to un to, and channeling about it to recognise what was, what was actually going on, what, how much this... I had actually attracted a whole group of other spirits that were actually wanting energy from me, as they do, that's the bribery, um, to occur. What happened then was I went, I don't, I don't want this anymore. It's actually damaging it was a whole group of men who were coming along projecting lots of emotions like my dad used to project don't you feel bad about yourself you're a good girl some of the stuff I said earlier but they were actually subtly wanting me to like they wanted to have the sexual relationship with me basically so I wasn't having any experiences of it or anything like that but there was an energetic pull at me that I should be interested in them and it was definitely a block between us what I decided, so I, I identified the bribery. I could feel it going on. I immediately felt disgusting, yucky, right? I, I don't want this anymore. So I, I channeled, I spoke to them. Um, I went through a process of a few days of really becoming very sensitive to when they were present and when they were gone. And so I sensitised to that because before I wasn't, I didn't want to feel it or see it. Uh, and, but once I sensitised to it, I started to break the addictions. What happened next was a whole bunch of threats <laughs> from the spirit world. Um, they started projecting at me and really became blackmail very quickly, projecting at me exactly the reverse emotions. So before they were helping me avoid a lot of, remember my true causal self, men don't like me, I'm yucky sexually, I'm unattractive, all of these things that I was carrying around, they were helping me avoid. They were saying, you're a good girl, you're lovely, you're someone to be proud of. As soon as I um, decided I wanted to quit the bribery, they started to project at me exactly the opposite thing. You're disgusting, you're horrible, who would want you anyway? All of this sort of stuff, all in an attempt to do what? Get me back in relationship with them. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like, it's quite obvious when they start doing that. See, this life, this one here, they're trying to make your life good. They try to make your life feel good so that you feel good and then once you feel good, you'll stay in this addiction or bribery with them. As soon as you get out of that, now they start projecting you exactly the opposite. They start attacking you. And that doesn't feel very good, does it? That, doesn't, that feels pretty bad. And so why are they attacking you? Because they want to get you back into this place where you were before. So their attack intensifies. And then once the threats don't work, then they actually try to carry out what they were threatening. 
So I've had spirits come to me saying, we're going to kill you, we're going to do all of this stuff to you, and so forth and so forth and so forth. And, and then they attempt to carry that out through a person. Like, I'll have people coming up to me, oh, I was told by some spirits that I should kill you, actually. And we're sitting there talking, it's like, they're saying it like it's like, like it's nothing. And I'm going, wow, like, yeah, I can feel the who's with you who want to do that. But what the person themselves could have easily followed through on that decision. And, uh, and, and in, in fact, historically, many people do. What do you think happens to most of these, most of these murdering rapists who get, who, get, um, who, who get the death penalty? They pass into the spirit world as a murdering rapist. What do you think they want to do still? Murder and rape. What, what do you think they, how do you think they're going to do that? By connecting with a person on earth who's willing to do it for them. And they do. And that's why a lot of the people on earth go, I can't remember what happened. Because a lot of times they weren't even present when it was happening because they'd gone out of body and the spirit had come in and away they go, doing their rampage until it stops, until the spirit can no longer maintain the control. So the spirits can carry out very negative things on, on us if we are open to the addiction. If we're not open to the addiction, it's totally impossible for a spirit or anyone else, alive or dead, to affect us. Does that make sense? And this is something we need to come to appreciate, is that the only reason why spirits affect us the way they do is because we're still in addiction with them. So whenever you feel the addiction, whenever you notice the spirits around affecting you a certain way, understand there's the, the addiction. Many of you go very tired when you hear some truth. There's an addiction there to avoid truth. The spirits just come along and say, oh, you don't want to hear this, turn off. Like I've seen some people turn off in a talk instantaneously when I'm speaking with them. Some of them have even asked a question and two minutes after they've asked the question, they've gone to sleep. All right? And I know sometimes I might be a bit boring and long-winded, but honestly, to do that two minutes after you've asked the question, there's something else going on. And a lot of times it's these spirit interplays with the addictions involved where I don't want to hear truth, I don't want to hear the truth, somebody says the truth, oh, I'm out to it already. How many of you have had that trouble listening to the DVD sometimes? Yeah, where you know, I've got to listen to this, I've got to listen to this. You sit down, force yourself to listen and you're off. Like, and I've got to listen to this again, I've got to listen to this. Sit down, force yourself to listen and you're off again. You're like, it's like this never ending. And you think, gee, AJ must be a boring speaker for this to happen all the time. But it's actually a lot of the times truth that you need to hear that spirits don't want you to hear. It's quite simple. And you're hooking into that addiction because you don't want to feel the causal emotion. And, yeah. and that's what I was going to say. That they go for bribery, th threats, blackmail, and the only way out of that cycle is to feel your true self. To feel, and ironically, they helped me. Mm. They were projecting at me all the things that I was resisting feeling. As soon as I submitted to that and released that, I was I was clearer as a soul, and they had less. They couldn't influence me anymore because yeah. I wasn't afraid to feel those feelings. They're always acting on the fear of the feelings. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, the microphone's there already. Is it, is it on? Because it didn't sound. Okay, I'll try. Okay, sorry. Um, I actually had that experience um, when you came to Coffs Harbour one time and I asked you a question and the answer I remembered you giving me was completely different to the answer you gave. And when I heard the tape a few weeks later, I just went... Wow, I know what just happened there. Yeah. I've had people purposefully tape my discussions with them because prior to them taping my discussions, they often went away thinking I said exactly the opposite to what I thought, what I said, and I've actually given them a recording that I've made of the discussion, given it to them, and they go, wow, I didn't even remember that discussion, yeah, and yet that was the discussion we had. And this happens all the time. And the reason why it happens is because we have so much influence going on around us because we are often in addiction, not wanting to hear truth. And so we start down, shutting down and that's when we even hear what they're saying to us more than we hear what's going on in the conversation. That's often the case. Yep. There was a question Car over. Uh, Carolina, yeah. 
Just behind, behind you, Deb. Behind first, Deb, if you can. Yeah. Thanks. And then we'll come to you, um, Deb. How do I recognise my addictions with the spirits? Because I, I know that I'm an addiction, but I don't... Like, what are the signs, something that I could look out for, to start? Oh, that wasn't for me. I guess, Carolina, I was really praying and focusing on this addictions issue. So I, and I began... I really began to deconstruct the relationship with Dad... And I was writing a lot about the emotions that I got from him. And in the previous relationship that I referred to earlier, what were the emotions I was getting there? And I'd just been in this process uh, for a couple of weeks of really looking at that, looking at my interactions with men and desiring truth, I suppose. Yeah, I was praying for it. Because before then, I didn't want to know. I actually just wanted to wander around feeling like I'm a good girl that someone can be proud of. Like, that's what I really wanted to feel. Um, and it wasn't until I set my intention for truth and to, to connect really with God and with my soulmate that I, it came to me very quickly, really, in the course of a couple of weeks. I went from like big like light bulb moments about my relationships with men to one day sitting there going, hang on, I'm getting that feeling right now. Who's giving me that right now? Like I can feel when I'm not and I'm getting it now. So, you know... I had to want to see truth about it, yeah. You have to be very open to the truth of your own feelings. You see, most of us want to stay quite close to the truth of our own feelings. We've, we, we don't want to know that we're in an addictive relationship sexually with a spirit, for example. Most of us would feel very yicky to actually contemplate that even. And so what we do is we just, we're like ostriches trying to bury our head in the sands about what's really going on half the time. And we need to allow the truth, the, the passion and desire for the truth to enter us, that we are passionate for the truth no matter what the truth is. No matter how dark and dismal it is, we need to have a passion for it. If you have a passion, that strong a passion for the truth, the answers will always come to you very rapidly. That's the way God works. Remember, I said quite frequently in the first century, keep on seeking it. Seeking the truth. Seek for it. It will open to you when you seek for it. That's one of God's laws. If you, if you want the truth badly enough, you will always find it. So if you, the problem is we're happy to seek for the external truth. You know, the, the, the bits that are out there away from us. But most of us are very avoiding of the internal stuff, the internal truth. What I really look like inside. And when we seek for that with a passion then it all comes to us. All of the truth about ourselves comes to us. A lot of it's going, oh, and a lot of times we're going, no, no, no more, no more, you know, because, because we're so afraid about it. But if we have that underlying desire and passion for God, we will want the truth at all times. And when we want it, that's when it comes to our life. Every single time, guaranteed. That's how God works. God's a loving God who always gives you what you want if it's pure, if the desire is pure. Deb? I understand um, about getting the good feelings from the spirits, but I, I, I'm not yet seeing how I'm giving to them. Um, in, uh, in response to the previous question, you don't want to know yet how you're giving to them. Can you see that? Well, I've, you've only just enlightened me that I might be in addiction to spirits. I agree. But you don't want to know yet that you're giving to them. Because the instant you want to know how you're giving to them, you'll start feeling it. You'll start realising, oh, that's what I'm doing. And you'll start seeing the patterns coming from the childhood patterns with the spirit. So a lot of the times we break the patterns with our parents and then we just engage in a whole new set of parents in the spirit world that we now have the same interactions with, basically. That's what we often do. And we just once we're willing to engage and realise that I am giving something to them, I am doing something with them, then we start seeing the truth to the whole interaction. There is never a one-way street when it comes to an interaction with spirits, ever. And we need to understand that. There is never a time when you are just receiving something from them. They would not be in an into, into, a, into an addictive relationship with you unless they were getting something out of it too. And the only spirits who are not going to do that are either your guides who are in a much more loving place 
or spirits that are on the divine love path in the celestial heavens. They're the only spirits who will not enter into addictive relationships with you. The rest of the spirits, including spirits right up to the sixth dimensional space, are going to enter into addictive relationships with you. There are many spirits, even in the sixth sphere, who want many of you to be their teachers, the teachers of their material. Not God's material, theirs. And they then look around for a person. Who can I, who can I connect to? Who can I connect? Ah, there's one. That person's developing emotionally. They're open to my direction. They've got all of these emotional injuries. I will feed them with my truth. Right? And as I do that, I'm, the Spirit's doing that to you. You're then in an addictive relationship. What do you get out of it? You might get glory, power, attention, approval. There are so many so-called world-renowned speakers on the planet today who are heavily Spirit-influenced, and all they're doing is exactly what the Spirit's telling them to do. I've mentioned some in previous discussions. I've actually read their personal experiences to you and, and outlined the exact time that they became overcloaked by those spirits. So this can easily happen too, by so-called loving spirits. Does that make sense? You will feel it when you're willing to acknowledge to yourself that it's happening, that for any spirit to be around you giving you something, they've got to be getting something out of it unless they are at one with God. Now, many of them might try to claim they are, but that's a different matter altogether. But, uh, and often they're not. It's the addiction that keeps on getting met. Now, guys, can I just address an emotion with all of you? You're getting quite down about this discussion. <laughs> Do you find it? Can you feel that? Yeah. It's like you all start to get heavy, yeah. man. Like, this is... This is uh, can you feel that everyone's sort of starting a, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no, no more. <laughs> and if I really respect your free will, I should stop right now. Can you see that? Because, because, because you don't want to hear anymore. And that's fine. We've already spoken for four hours, so I understand. <laughs> but, uh, but can you see how even the feeling in the audience, you, you can all feel it. You can feel the feeling coming over you, right? There are feelings through your attraction, through your addictions. What do you want to hear from me? Oh, I'm a lovely person. <laughs> I've got everything sorted out. I've got my life sorted out. I've got my, my relationship sorted out. Us and me, me and Mary were just so close together. Nothing could interfere and with that. Like, and you guys are so developed. Yeah, you are it's just so wonderful. Developed. You know, You're like that close to it. The love in you is just outstanding <laughs> and it's beautiful to see. There's nothing I can say to you about any of Can you see the addiction in play? See, every time I talk about a subject that is challenging for you, like, remember when I talked about the anger subject? Half of the audience, like, most of the audience who would normally be there wasn't, weren't even there. When I talked about the parent discussion, nobody rocked up. Because <laughs> nobody... people. No, well, yeah, it's not, it's an exaggeration. Maybe 20 or 30 people rocked up when normally there'd be hundreds there. Why? Because nobody wants to hear how bad a parent they've been. That's an addiction. Can you see that? We, we, we're so close to seeing the truth. We're not, the key is to not judge it. You see, we, we judge it. And that's what causes us to go into these layers of depression and apathy and trying to get away from it. You don't need to do that. We just need to be aware. Remember what I read right at the beginning. Divine love cannot enter your soul until your soul has an awakening to its true condition. The awakening to its true condition is including all of its expectations, all of its demands, all of its unloving behaviour. This is a good thing you're hearing. And it is, like, <laughs> can I second that? It, like, I, honestly, having walked this very recently, this is amazing. It is so good. Yes, it feels a bit icky and hard and At the hurty, beginning in particular, and, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, really. At the beginning, it's it like feels bad. Like, it feels like, this, I, I hurt everywhere I hurt, like bits of me hurt, um, but it is like the awakening is beautiful. It is beautiful because, sorry. I'm just keeping my gag. <laughs> we, we both need a gag now because I'm like. I, <laughs> the, the reason why I, w I wanted to just mention like what Mary found is that she went from feeling powerless in her own progression into feeling a state of in total power and control of her own progression just by recognising what was in play. 
Does that make sense? And every time you deny it, every time you want to not hear about this, you're taking away from yourself your own power to change. That's what you're doing. And, and you're giving the power away. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> and, uh. and, you know, honestly, especially with this stuff with spirits, the energy that I have now that I didn't have before because unwittingly I was giving out energy in all these addictive ways all of the time. To actually start to break down the addictions, it's a bit painful, it's a bit scary, it's like often you want to run back. <laughs> but at the end of it, you have more energy to direct in the places that you want to go. And that is really empowering. Mm. It's very empowering. At the moment, if you could think about it, there's all these tentacles of suction coming off you going out to, through your addictions and through the people that you're addicted to. There's all these, you know, coming out of you, like, and, and, and it drains the life out of you. And you can feel that. You can feel that. If you spend a day with people, how do you feel at the end? Oh. Now, how many people do you come away from the end of the day going, wow, that really motivated me, that, oh, I feel really good about it. And then the other people, you come away, well, that was pretty heavy, you know. Like, boy, I feel like going to sleep now for a few days and having a bit of grog to get me there, you know. Because that's the effect that people's emotions have on you that sucks the life out of you, right? And this is what we've got to be careful of, is that it's our addictions that cause the sucking of the life out of us. And we're so willingly is... letting ourselves be sucked. Like, you know, yeah, here you have a bit of me, I'll have a bit of you, and we'll yeah. avoid our true self. It's no wonder we've got no energy. It's no wonder by the time we're 70 we're old and decrepit and we've got lines around us and can hardly do anything. Generally, that's the way it is. Now, sorry for you 70-year-olds who are not like that, then obviously you've got a bit more energy than that. But, but this, is what hap this is why our bodies decay. Do you think God created your body to decay? Like, come on, like, God's a perfect God with unlimited energy, with unlimited, like, the genetic structure in your body is absolutely perfect. Scientists are still trying to discover why we die. I'm telling you why you would die. Because you're getting your life sucked out of you by all these addictions that are in play, right? And, and that's what's happening in our life. We're, we're, we're giving and giving and all these different things in unloving ways, and it's the unlovingness that sucks us dry. It kills us in the end. We die from it. You call it old age. I don't. I call it sin and error. Because that's what it is. It's actually the unlovingness that's in our soul that's creating all of these effects. Does that make sense? So, so let yourself ponder about these truths rather than just going, oh, this is a heavy subject. Wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow might be better. <laughs> That's where we do action. A lot of addiction in actions. Yeah. That's like, we'll have a job. <laughs> let's avoid all of these terrible emotions about, about how we feel and let's get into the God's Way of Love Learning Centre. That'll be fun. And, and let's avoid... Do you think I'm going to let you do that? <laughs> like, like, do you think I've started an organisation to cheer you up? <laughs> Is that what you think? Because if you think that, you better not come along tomorrow. I, I'm starting an organisation to help you put into practice love and to be challenged so that the, that the love itself and the challenges expose the emotions within you that are blocking your relationship with God. That's why, we're, that's why I want to do what we're doing. So the whole discussion tomorrow is going to be about the God's way of love organisation, if you like. Now, it's an organisation that myself and Mary have founded because of our desire. We don't have any world domination issues. We don't want to <laughs> do all this. We have a desire to demonstrate love in action, and it's a lovely tool that we can use to do that in, in creating things in the process. And, and do you think that we're going to let you avoid your addictions? We're going, no, nah, you go home. No, nah, you go home too. You go Oh, everyone's gone home. What's going on? <laughs> everyone's in their, in their addictions. So what we want to do is get through these uh, processes where we don't want to feel about certain things. Many times when we talk about anger, we talk about fear, and we talk about addictions, many of you get very heavy with those discussions. That's telling you something, right? There's no need for heaviness here. It's just a matter of identifying what place we're in and working through it so that we can release it. That's all we're talking about. And, and tomorrow we'll, help, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with some practical ways you can do that. Right? And if I can just um, 
reiterate, I suppose. Do you remember at the beginning I drew my inner circle and I said, now there's joy and God in there along with a lot of grief still. And like, I just want to encourage you because it's just been such a powerful process for me to recognise that God responds to the humble heart, you know, the repentant heart, the heart that is willing to look and see, whoa, I'm in total addiction here, or whoa, that's totally unloving, and I I don't even want to give it up yet. But even just recognising that is such a, it's such a step closer to that inner self where we can actually start to experience joy and God. And isn't that the reason why we're all on this path? Because we inside of us we really deeply desire it and I know that all of you do because frankly it's pretty like you've got to really want God and really seek truth to be in the town hall in Mergen with Jesus and Mary Magdalene right now don't you (laughs) but it's about humility and I've learned it uh, probably the long way (laughs) It's taken me three years and you've all watched me or many of you have watched me on that journey. But I just want to express to you how beautiful it is to be stepping into that place. And I know you feel heavy with it, but if you can feel empowered in these truths that you're receiving and recognising that, wow, maybe these just are my stepping stones to joy and God. Mm. We'll see you tomorrow, hey? So um, can we just, before we go, though, summarise what we'll be doing tomorrow? Um, So for those of you who want to come, we're we're going to be having a discussion tomorrow about the God's Way of Love organisation and we're going to be dealing specifically with uh, setting up uh, projects and teams, learning projects and learning teams to help confront some of you with different emotions. That's the whole purpose of the, the teams. We're, there's two locations where we're considering setting them up initially. Uh, there's been people who have been uh, will, ready, who are ready to have their different properties being used, and uh, and many of them, are, some of them, there's two properties in particular that look like they'll be finished up being donated once the organisation receives its non-profit status, which we've already applied for, and and we can get everything going. And so um, tomorrow is all about actually putting some things into practice about day-to-day living and all those other things uh, in regard to being in harmony with love and truth in the process. So you're going you're to outline the vision, aren't you? The vision for the organisation yep. and then talk about some of the practical uh, groupings and teams that we might have uh, working on those properties. Now, many of you may have had the opportunity to read the constitution of the organisation. Is that correct? Yep. So if you haven't done that, uh, if you read that, that'll help you a lot uh, for tomorrow's discussion. But uh, it's a long constitution, so it might take you longer than a day to read. Um, you know what I'm like about those things. So, uh, but what we're doing tomorrow is really looking forward to presenting uh, to you a vision of how we can work together to actually work through these addictions and emotions that we have got going on, but also create something in the process that's harmonious with love. And uh, what I feel we will create is going to be something that has never been demonstrated on earth before if all of us sincerely embrace our relationship with God and also sincerely wish to deal with our own unlovingness, want to deal with what's going on inside of ourselves. Do you want to mention about about, uh, the study groups? Oh, yes, uh, you can mention about it. Okay. Uh, as a part of it, we're really focusing this year on helping people to uh, live the principles that we're discussing a lot more. So the organisation is a big opportunity to do that. I'm also working on another project, which is um, uh, study groups for small groups in uh, different areas. So you would have a course of um, study, if you like. Uh, I don't like that word yet, but... Um, it would be a way of stepping through different principles and lessons on the path in a small group format. So you would have something prepared, it would be on the net. Um, a, a facilitator would download the material for the week and talk, walk the group through that material, the activity, the reading, the whatever it is, the bit of, it might be an excerpt from a DVD. It's just a way to pinpoint more specific areas that perhaps would help people grow in their relationship to God. So that's something else that we're hoping to launch on the new website, which is not quite up and running yet. 
So I've been programming two websites in the last few weeks, and so um, one of them is almost complete now, and I hope to have that uploaded within the next uh, two weeks. So that'll be the Divine Truth website. It has a completely different look and feel than the current one does. Um, so, and hopefully we'll also start adding onto that the details about study groups and so forth as well. And then we're also making up a website for the God's Way of Love organisation, outlining all of the learning centres, learning teams and the projects, the different projects that will be happening at the different ve ve uh, venues. And, uh, and so it'll be a way of in keeping on informing you. What we're going to stop doing actually is sending out emails. We, we're spammers now. <coughs> like many of you didn't receive the email, yeah? Because it went to your spam box. And it's just been a bit of a hassle actually trying to get emails out because there's, I don't know, a lot of people on the mailing list. Well, there's now th thousands of people on the mailing list and it's a bit difficult to do that. So what we're going to do is put letters and other stuff like that on the internet so any letters that we give out, we'll, we'll, we'll be actually placing on certain locations on the internet itself. So that way you can just visit that site at any time you want and see what's going on in the locations. And it will be up to us to make sure that that's kept up to date. Um, the only reason why the website hasn't been kept up to date the last few months is because I've been working on a brand new website. So, um, and you'll see the brand new website in the next couple of weeks. Mary thinks it's pretty good, even if I do say so myself. <laughs> and... Uh, it's and okay, there's photos though, I'm not really happy about that. Mary's not happy about the photos. Uh, but, so we've got photos of different things on the website and things like that. It's a, it's a, bit, it's a bit more modern than website than what you're used to, right? <laughs> um, but we're hoping that... Uh, we're also now, uh, through Igor's, a lot of Igor and Lena's help, we've been uploading uh, the videos of all the sessions to YouTube. There are now complete... Uh, sessions on YouTube as one session that you can download at a time, two hour sessions pretty much at a time. And uh, Igor's just been slowly uploading those as we go through the different masters. And so what that means is that two or three days, usually after an event such as this, you will be able to see the event on the net on YouTube. And it's not only just to watch, <laughs> yeah. Awesome it's really work. great, yeah. <laughs> So there's so much work happening behind the scenes by, with a few people involved. And, and we need to thank everyone who's really helped today as well. Yeah, um, setting up as well today. Can you thank... <laughs> We'd like to thank the people involved in copying all those DVDs for you. Um, that, as you can imagine, that's all... At the moment, it's been done um, using our own effort. Yep. We have three DVD towers that are 11 DVD towers. And... And the ladies involved spend a lot of their time shoving in DVDs, pulling them out, putting in, putting out, and so forth. And so we'd just like to thank them so much for their time. What we'll be doing on the new website, actually, is every person who volunteers to assist us in some way will be putting their details on the website so you have the opportunity to donate to them sp directly, just out of appreciation for their effort of what they're doing. And uh, it also allows the law of attraction to work perfectly in their case about finances and so forth as well. So um, there's a lot of things that are, we want to change uh, this year and uh, get things started this year. And so we're looking forward to our year. And, and uh, we hope that uh, you might enjoy some of the ride as well. <laughs> Lovely to see you all after so long. Yeah, it is. And uh, we'd just like to thank you for your time again today. We know sitting down for four hours in a relatively humid environment, listening to us speak sometimes has, uh, has its own cost. So we'd just like to thank you for coming along. And we'd also like to thank you for coming to Mergen. Like, because it, it's uh, not a place we would normally have done a workshop, normally we're doing them along the coast where there's high density people. And we realise that each of you have probably travelled a long time and you've had to set up accommodation and all those kind of things. And all of that requires some effort. But I think over the coming weeks or so, you'll enjoy seeing some of the results of that effort too that you've personally brought in just to even be here today. So we'd like to thank you for coming along today. We'd like to thank the guys, the Channel 7 guys, for not interrupting our, <laughs> our session today and being so uh, um, friendly and warm with us. Uh, we realise that that doesn't necessarily... We don't have any expectations about the outcome of what they produce. And so it may be different than what it, it, it might seem, but um, we'd just like to thank you guys for, uh, for just treating us in a loving manner that you have, actually. 
Thanks, so thanks for that. So tomorrow we start again at one. Uh, it'll be, um, it'll be, the topic will be the God's Way of Love organisation. But again, the focus is going to be on emotions. And so if you can come prepared. But we'll be outlining a lot of different uh, ideas that we have that we want to put together with you. And by the end of the day, we're hoping to set up what we're calling uh, Learn. learning teams that, uh, that will be in all areas of all facets of life. And we'll see, it's going to be a bit messy initially because many of you will have your addictive emotions in play. <laughs> and so it'll be a bit messy initially and we'll sort out the mess over the next few months and hopefully we'll accomplish some things that we'd really like to see accomplished. And you'll enjoy also translating a lot of the things that you learn in those places into your own personal lives, into your own homes, into your own, uh, into your own veggie gardens and all sorts of practical things as well will be happening. So we're really looking forward to doing that with you. Yeah. Thanks for your time again, guys, today, and we'll catch you tomorrow for those of you who <laughs>